to the classic, ow, my hair kind of car. You don't want to go on a first date in a Viper because she's probably not going to come back. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage Pandemic Edition. This is where we have a camera on a tripod and we just kind of talk about the car. Car featuring today, 1993 Dodge Viper. You know, it's, it's so funny to buy a car and have it long enough to have it become a classic because it sneaks up on you, you don't even realize it. I mean, this car is now 27 years old. I, it seems like I just got it the other day. And it looks like I just got it the other day because I, I keep it pretty nice. I rarely wash the car, I usually wipe it down and probably wash it maybe once a year or something like that. I think that's why the paint and everything has, has stayed so well. Uh, some of the plastic on the dash beginning to deteriorate, but that's just due to age. This is probably, quote, the most brutal addition of the car. Uh, no airbag, no ABS, no track, no nothing on this car. They got a little more uh, sophisticated as, uh, as the generation was on. But this first generation, it's hard to relay the impact this car had when it came out. Prior to this, the most powerful American car you could buy, I think, was probably the Corvette ZR1, 375 horsepower, which seemed unbelievable. This is a V10 aluminum engine with 400 horsepower, which just seemed unbelievable. I remember when I went to look at this car, the salesman said, you know, because of emissions and all this, you'll never see 400 horsepower in a car ever again. If you don't buy it now, that's it. The oh, okay, and I fell for it. <laughs> and of course, 400 now is less than the base horsepower of the new Corvette. But at the time, it was very, very impressive with, what is it, 465 foot-pounds of torque, I believe. This, this is a torque monster, and it's a lot of fun to drive. I'm sure you know, all know the origins of the car. Uh, Bob Lutz, a buddy of mine, and uh, just a real car guy. You know, he's the one that got BMW to be the ultimate driving machine and ran a bunch of car companies before he got to Chrysler. And he and Tom Gale, who was uh, the head of design at Chrysler, you know, uh, Bob Lutz owned a uh, Cobra replica, but he took all the Ford and and everything off of it because, well, he was the head of Chrysler, but he still loved it. And he loved driving it, and, and he was telling Tom Gale one day about it, and he said, you know, we should build the modern version of a Cobra. And that's what they did. They wanted the most basic sports car you could get, but with the benefit of sophisticated tuning on the chassis and the suspension and the six speed and you know a modern engine and all this kind of stuff. Uh, they originally started with the idea of a V8, but then went to the big V10 from the truck. But the trouble was that engine was cast iron. Now, a lot of people think Lamborghini built the engine for these. They did not. Lamborghini were experts in casting aluminum and making big aluminum castings, you know, for their V12s and all that. So they went to Lamborghini to help with the casting of the engine. But the engine was built and designed right here in America. As I said, 488 cubic inches or eight liters. Uh, which was massive, and, and a V10, which was shockingly new at the time. This car was priced around $50,000, which was about $14,000 less, I think, than the top-of-the-line Corvette at the time. Now, there were other cars in the early 90s that had more than 400 horsepower, but they were Aston Martin, they were Ferrari, they were Lamborghini, and they weren't that much more and they were certainly hundreds of thousands of dollars more than this. So this was the bargain of the day. It had no roll-up windows. It had no outside door handles. You couldn't lock it. It appeared to be the most useless automobile you could find at the time, which just made it more and more desirable. I mean, that's what I loved about it. When I got it, you had a tonneau cover you could put over. So like the English sports cars back in the day were the passenger seat would be covered and you could have the heater on. And yeah, you know, it's, I, I, I just love it here. Uh, it always makes me laugh when people say to me, hey, why are the radio speakers on the hood? Well, those aren't radio speakers, those are air vents, but okay, that's okay. You know, it's an interesting car. The, the success of this car is based on the fact that half the people love it and half the people hate it. And, and that's sort of what they 
the idea was. You don't want to design a car where people just go, it's okay. You know, you want something where they go, I love that, or, oh, uh, I could see why people think it's rather cartoonish and exaggerated, but that's okay. Uh, it's a wonderful car to drive. I can't believe I've had this 27 years. And it's been relatively uh, maintenance free. There were some teething problems early in the day. You know, Chrysler was terrific. Uh, when I got this car, they would call me and say, eh, we're getting some excessive wear. We want to put new pistons and stuff in your car. I said, fine. And they came by here and did the whole thing here at the shop, uh, put new pistons in and went through it. And then it was fine. It was fine. Because this was, this was, you know, I had ordered the very first black Viper. First year production, I think they built 285 and 92. And uh, this was the first full year of production. And then Tom Gale called me to say, no, I got the very first black one. You got the second black one. And I said, oh, OK. Well, that's fine with me, because Tom Gale was the, the guy who designed it. So that seemed more than fair to me. So that was cool. But it was a pretty quick gestation period for this car, less than three years from, from sort of drawing board to being uh, released to the public. It was a show car in 89. And people thought, well, no, but they're never going to build that. That's kind of you know exaggerated looking and had no no door locks or nothing. Uh, then what happened was, I think it was in 91, the Dodge Stealth was going to be the pace car at the uh, Indy 500. And the United Auto Workers hit the roof because the Stealth was not made in America. It was made in Japan, I believe. And so they quickly substituted this and got Carroll Shelby to drive it. And then the order started coming in and people went crazy for the car. And they figured, we got to build this thing, you know? And that's what they did. They put together, put together a dedicated team of men and women to work on it and build it. And I went to the Connors Avenue plant where they built these, which is really, I think, smaller than the garage here. But it was fascinating to see the enthusiasm, the excitement of the men and women putting these cars together. You know, how the Viper shirts and the, I mean, they, they just loved the whole idea. It was fun to see people excited about an American car that wasn't a minivan. Because don't forget, Chrysler at that point was, you know, doing minivans and K cars and all that kind of stuff. I remember they took uh, Lee Iacocca for a ride. They figured, oh, we got to sell it to the big boss at the time, you know. So uh, Lee Iacocca went for a ride and said, oh, you got to build this. This is unbelievable, you know. It was like reminiscent of the Mustang and the Cobra. And, and that's basically what they did four wheel disc brakes, six speed transmission. It's, crude and loud and very sort of American, just way more horsepower than it needed at the time. 400 was a number back in 1992, kind of like 700 was when, when they first re revealed the Hellcat with 706 horsepower. With 700, that's great, what, that, that, that's, that's crazy, you know. Uh, but no, and it keeps going higher and higher and I have no idea where it's gonna end, although this, uh, Corona thing seems to sort of put a damper on high horsepower and fun and all that kind of stuff for a while, but not forever. So I think this is why uh, these have become sort of instant, cla well, instant classics 30 years later. And you can still find these first generation. First generation went 92, I believe the 95 or technically 96. They're built of, uh, I'm not quite sure how many, a few thousand. Um, and the car got more sophisticated. You know, it got air conditioning and a few other things later on. Air conditioning was not available the first year. Uh, the, this window pops out, and the two, and and you have these sort of. Well, I'll show you. I'll show you all the stuff you got with it. Um, let's open the hood and take a look inside because that was always the most impressive part of this car. Was the uh, was what's under the hood? Come on, let's take a look. For a long time, this front clip was the single most expensive American automobile replacement part you could get. I think it was $24,000 or something crazy thing like that. Okay, we got the hood open. Here's that massive aluminum V10. Uh, we've done a few things to it, nothing major. Uh, Chrysler, as I mentioned, replaced the pistons and rings and everything after about 1,000 miles and in fine since. This is when I first hooked up with my old friend John Hennessy down there in Texas. You know, he builds the Venom and all those crazy 
He was the first guy to break 200 in a Mustang and a few other things like that. Uh, we changed the intake up here a little bit. Uh, we put different exhaust systems on. The biggest change we put was 377 rear end in it. I believe this had something like, uh, I'm not sure what the stock rear end was. It was like 321 or maybe 290s. I'm not sure it was low because they wanted gas mileage and they wanted, uh, with of course, the benefit of higher top end. But I'm not a, going for top end. You just want that acceleration. And the 377 gears really make it jump, really make it a lot faster. And, and that's basically what we did. Um, as you can see, it's all original car, nicely maintained. Still got less than 10,000 miles on it. Uh, it's just something I take out and it's fun to drive. You know, you get that perfect California day. Uh, what else can we explain? Everything here is pretty self-explanatory. You know, maintenance on these is not bad at all. In fact, it's actually quite good. You just change your fluids every whatever you choose, 5,000 miles, 3,000 miles. Uh, once a year, do um, you know coolant, antifreeze, do brake fluid every, year. and you're fine, and you're fine, and this thing will last forever. Uh, the transmission, the rear end, everything's pretty bulletproof. It's hard to break. Most of these have been <laughs> beaten to with just an inch of their life, and they seem to take it pretty well. I mean, uh, it's the classic American sports car in that it's simple, crude but incredibly powerful, incredibly fast, and incredibly reliable. Uh, what else can we show you under here? Well, that's, a, that's about it, I guess. Come on, go around the back of the car. You see how this shuts, sets in there. You don't want to crack this piece. Oh my God, it's expensive. This is the antenna. Well, cars still have antennas, but they don't look like this anymore. You know, when I was in high school, that's guys doing a fight, getting a fight with a guy, and they find a car, rip the antenna, beat the guy with it. That was uh, quite popular. There's no button to open the truck. You actually have to use the key. Put the key in here, turn that. Okay. There we go. This is the tonneau cover. Look, you even got a spare tire, which you don't get anymore. You know, I don't get the no spare tire thing. I hate when they give you that stupid can of ready whip or whatever it is. It's just about as useful. You put it in there. It's not going to fix a hole in your tire. I've never seen one of those work because most tires crack at the sidewall. I don't know why they just can't put, and this is not even a full-size tire, but this is the tonneau cover that goes over the, uh, goes over the, over the passenger seat, or you can put it over, it also goes over the steering wheel as well here. It's not really an anti-theft device, but I carry it anyway. Anyway, there she got that there. And you've got your tool kit here, which I don't think I've opened this in 20 years. Let's see what's in it. I haven't opened this in 20 years. Oh, oh this is the service manual. Here we go, there we go. There's your Owner's manual, service manual. As you can see, it's never been opened. You know, guys, you fix it first, and then when you can't fix it, then you go to the manual. That's sort of the rule. Uh, let's see here. Put this back in here for another 20 years. But everything here is pretty simple. You know, you still have a stick holding it up here. They wanted to save weight wherever they could, so there's no hydraulic struts or anything like that. Gas cap is right here. And this, of course, acts as a roll bar. Uh, that's about it. There's not a whole lot to this thing. Uh, well, let's, let's go over the dashboard and the controls. As you can see, it's pretty crude in here. Not the highest grade plastic. And we use something on this. This is why I actually decided to make my own cleaning products and it kind of damaged the dash a little bit here. Uh, we are missing one of these. This, you know, these little kind of pieces, the tab broke off and I think this is, 
it's the right size here this goes in here and yeah see the tab is these two broke off so it doesn't fit so i've got to order a new one of those but let's go over i love the steering wheel i love the fact that it's a non-airbag wheel i love the size i love the shape of it i love it doesn't interfere with the controls 180 mile an hour speedometer and warning lights in here tachometer here a water temperature oil pressure fuel and of course ammeter gauge uh, this might look like an air conditioning <laughs> setup but it's not this is just lower speed cold or hot and then you want it in your face you want it in your legs or you want both uh, radio with a cassette player try and find a cassette and you got some driving light switches and your no power plug an actual cigarette lighter because this is still the arrow of the Marlboro wrapped up in the sleeve. Uh, okay, got your little, this always made me laugh, this little stupid ashtray here, like you're smoking, like the ashes are actually gonna go in there. Okay, okay. Seats are actually quite comfortable. The later Viper, the coupe has the adjustable pedals. This one, the seat actually moves on this model. As I said, this is the first generation. Uh, and the seat does recline a little bit too, as well, so. Uh, no mirror, and like there's nothing on, I mean, this is about as basic as it gets, but it's pretty easy to work on and not a lot, not a lot can break on this. It's, it's, it's extremely robust for a 30 year old car. It more than keeps up with modern traffic and is, and it, it's still very fast. And since we put these 377 rear ends in it, it really gives a lot more, as my dad would call it, pep. That's my dad would say. This thing's got a lot of pep. Yeah, I'm surprised. Thanks, Pop. Yeah, my dad would always do that. My dad would always say, slow down, you're going a mile a minute. I go, Pop, that's only 60 miles an hour. Don't worry, it's not that big a deal, Pop. And it's sort of a throwback to the original Kobe. You got these snaps up here on the dash where the tonneau cover would fit so you could cover it if you were driving with the top down but you wanted to protect something or keep the interior hidden or whatever. You just snap those on, which I don't think any American cars had these well, since the 50s or 60s. So that's kind of cool. But let me show you the accessory package you get when you buy one of these. It's got the roof in it, the side windows, the top. Here, come on, I'll show you. Now, first off, you got the tonneau cover right here, which fits. Uh, these go in the slots where the windows go. This goes over the two headrests. That goes over the steering wheel. You see, you unzip that so the rest of the car can be sealed up, except for the driver's compartment. Then you got these over here. These are your side curtains. You know, this looks like a Middle Eastern woman wearing a burqa when you put all this up there with these dopey windows. I've never had these on. It just makes the car look just awful. But anyway, that's what these are. And there's the bag to keep them in. This is the roof that folds up. This has never been on the car. And metal crafters who built the original Dodge Viper uh, show car, they're down in Orange County. They did it out of uh, aluminum, I guess. Uh, well, it was metal, certainly. I think it was aluminum. And uh, they built me the metal top for this one, which I have over there. It didn't come from the factory, but they did that for me because I was friends with Marcello and the Gafogio family. The Gafogio family does fabulous show cars. At least they did. I'm not sure if they're doing it anymore. Anyway, they built the original Viper show car that uh, went on the show circuit and sort of made the car famous. And then in here, you have the back window. That fits in here. I guess you're supposed to keep all this stuff in your garage. And then when you want to take this out in the rain or snow, I guess you put it all in there. That's the packet to keep the side windows in. Conceivably, this all fits in the trunk. I'm not quite sure how it does that, but I think it does. I've never done it, but the top has never been up on this thing. But, you know, when I first got it, it was just exciting. It was like buying an English sports car from the 50s where you got all these kind of little accessories and all these kind of cool things. So uh, it's really a, a fascinating automobile. And it's a period in American history or American automotive history I don't think will be repeated. You know, we're so into gas mileage and hybrids and all that type of thing now. The days of building an out-and-out -out roadster. You know, this to me was a home run. Never cared much for the Prowler. I didn't quite get that with the V6. I thought it 
needed at least a V8. But this thing, still great fun to drive, and it still makes you harken back to the feelings of driving a Shelby Cobra. And I think it's probably fair to say this first generation was about as fast as the 427 Cobra was when it premiered. I could be wrong, but I think it was about the same. But anyway, come on, let's, uh, let's take it for a ride and uh, show you what it's like to drive without the windows in the top. First of all, I want to apologize if the sound is bad on this one because, you know, this is a pandemic deal going on here. I don't have my crew, I don't have my sound guy, I don't have my light guy. We just got the one camera. We stick it on the windshield. We got a GoPro in the back. And that's it, so. You don't realize what a breath of fresh air this car was when it was introduced back in 92. I think this car helped to make the Corvette better because Corvette realized they had the only game in town, at least as far as American sports cars were concerned. They had the most powerful engine. Why keep upgrading? Let's just keep selling a different version of the same thing. When this came along, then suddenly, you know, Z06s came along and all these other uh, iterations of the Corvette just to make it better. So it shows you competition doesn't prove the breed. And when Corvette got better, then Viper realized, well, we can't keep building it without traction control and ABS. We got to up our game. So the whole thing improved. I mean, I think that's why American companies are successful. Competition improves the breed. You never quite know what the next guy is going to do. So you want to make yours better just in case. I think these will become more and more valuable as time goes on because they only built a few. I don't think Chrysler made any money on these Dodge Vipers. If they were what they call a halo car, you know? Dodge was just selling minivans and K cars and stuff like that. So when this came along, it was truly a halo car. People went to the dealership to see it and then usually wound up buying something else. But there was that effect, you know? I mean, I think that worked for Nissan. I really had no interest in many of the Nissans until that uh, GTR came along and it was like, whoa, this thing is impressive, you know? And I, I think it uh, helps the whole line. So that's why they often do it, you know? I don't think Ford makes any money with a Ford GT, but the fact that when you win Le Mans and the halo effect helps to sell Mustangs and, and other cars. I mean, this really is the father of the Hellcat, you know? This is a classic example of there's no substitute for cubic inches. I mean, this is the car that defines that. And it's a big two-valve engine. You know, when this engine was developed, it was originally supposed to be a four-valve, twin cam, all kinds of trick stuff. And they realized, nah, it's getting a little expensive. So they just went with the two-valve engine. And uh, it, it works fine. Plenty of bottom end on it. diagnostics that didn't come along till 96 a lot of people burn themselves on the exhaust pipes when they get out of it that's sort of the red badge of courage when you have one of these you know that's uh, I remember when I got this car back in 90 I guess uh, yeah just about the beginning of 93 I had just gotten it and uh, my wife and I were going to uh, uh, the Emmy Awards you know so my wife says I'll go down to the dry cleaner and pick up my dress I said, okay. So she had this black, you know, cocktail dress thing. Okay. I said, I, I'll go down and get it. So I, I drive down. Of course, they take the long way, you know, take the Viper. So I get to the uh, dry cleaners and I put the dress right here on the seat. I go, okay. I'm going to take the long way home, you know, get on the freeway, go up in the hills for a little bit. So I got on the freeway. I nail it just like that. And I look in the rearview mirror, and I go, my mirror's black. What happened? Just as I see my wife's dress doing this, ooh, just head and I go, ah, ah, I just put my hand up, and I caught, I, I caught the, uh, the, um, 
the coat hanger. You know, the coat hanger with my finger like, ah, and the dress is gone. I go, oh, oh. So I mean, I mean to slow down, I pull off right, and it, just, uh, and it settles down, and I put it down in the seat. Oh my God. Oh my God. If I had lost that dress, I wouldn't be here now. I'd be dead. I mean, this is a classic, ow, my hair kind of car. You know? You don't want to go on a first date in a Viper because she's probably not going to come back. But I think it's fair to say Chrysler did a good job in building a modern version of the Cobra without being a Cobra or looking like a Cobra. That was Lee Iacocca's thing too, he said. You can build it, just don't make it look like a Cobra. I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. And it doesn't look anything like a Cobra. Doesn't have a V8. Doesn't have a four speed. Doesn't have the rounded uh, body like a Cobra. So I think they did a good job of getting the essence and the feel of the Cobra without being a Cobra, being another Cobra replica. And it goes without saying, you can get way more than 400 horsepower out of these motors. I've got a 96 coupe, that was 450 when it came out. And that, of course, the last iteration was well over 600. And the six-speed is the perfect transmission for this car. You know, I've seen these first generations for as low as 20, 25,000. And some, you know, maybe double that for the best one in the world. But I also remember when Cobras were $80,000. Back in the mid-80s, I built a replica for about 45 to 50,000, because the real Cobra was 80. Well, now the replica's still worth about 50,000, but the original, oh my God, you know, well, you see what they go for. Same thing with Hemi Kudas and all of those. So you can find yourself one of these. I, I suggest you grab it because, like I said, easy to work on, pretty straightforward, nothing tricky, incredibly powerful. Well, as we know, you're getting old, you know, when you buy a brand new car and it suddenly becomes a classic. Oh, man. But that's okay. I like that I had the foresight to buy one of these back in the day. Anyway, that's just a quick look at the Viper. You know, there's all kinds of, you know, the Viper Club is fantastic. Those guys have a wealth of knowledge. Parts are available. Everything's available. You know, you get all the thrills and everything of the original Cobra, but with at least more modern brakes and suspension. True, there's no ABS and no traction control or none of that, but you know, if you pay attention and know how to drive a car properly, you don't really need it. It's not a big deal. And like I say, it's a perfect car for a California day like today. So I'm gonna go drive around this around for a while. That's the only reason I shot this one today was I thought, well, it's a nice day. Let me take the Viper out. See, I always need a reason to do something. So that's my reason, so uh, I figured I'll take it out, get the engine warm, drive it a little bit, put a few miles on it. And uh, hey, it's a pandemic, there's nothing else to do. So we'll see you, uh, see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Mm-hmm. <laughs>